All right, well, let's get into today's presentation. I love it when we have the entire HCM team. Many of you know Jim and Rhonda, who are both senior consultants, and each of them have had the advantage of working within a payroll or HR department. So they understand your daily tasks, your demands, and certainly your frustrations. And Brandy, as most of you know, is an employee with the most seniority here at CS3 with over, I guess she's pushing 20 years now. Um, of course, all those years of experience with HR payroll and also accounting um, provides each of you with uh, expert guidance and insights into all of her vast knowledge. And I'm excited to introduce Mary Lou for the first time. Um, she's uh, presenting for uh, Smart Talks for the first time today. And while she's relatively new to the CS3 team, she brings years of scissor tail and Kronos experience to the team. So we're so excited to have you in as well. So with that, Brandy, I'm going to make you presenter and let your team take over. So if you guys want to unmute yourselves and Show us your smiling faces on your webcams. Brenda, you're still muted. I can't hear you yet. All right. I think Mary Lou, can you see my screen? I can see your screen. Thank you. All right. You're good to go. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Today, we are going to cover a lot of ground on the powerful reporting options in Sizzertel HCM. We will be presenting in a roundtable format where you will hear us discussing the topics at hand. Without further ado, let's get started. I will be talking about TLM reports and how to add and remove columns, create automated reports, and how to export them. Let's start with columns. In Scissortail, you can customize what columns you see in a report. Within any report, you can add or remove columns as well as move columns left or right. To add or remove columns, click the action menu icon or the three ellipses on the right, located just above the report. Select add remove columns. The Add Remove window will appear. The list of available columns and current columns are located here. Above the list, you will see a search box. You can enter one or more keywords to find a column. To add a column, check the box next to an option in the Available Columns section and click the Add button. It will now be moved to the current columns list. To remove a column, check the box next to an option in the current columns and click the Remove button, and it will return to the available columns list. To make the report easier to read, you may need to move the order of the columns. To move the order of the current columns, check the box next to the item line you want to move. Then click up and down arrows to the location you want. Make sure to click on apply to activate the changes. In the report, you also have the ability to customize a single column by hovering over the header. Click on the down arrow next to the column name. You can set up filters. Jim will be discussing filters later, so stay tuned. You can sort columns in the ascending or descending order. Also, when setting up a report, you may find you need the header of the column to read differently or align to the right or center of the column. By selecting the column settings, you will be able to do this. Once you have customized your report to your liking, you will need to save the settings. To save the report settings, 
click the action menu icon or the three ellipses. Select either save view or save view as. When you select either save view or save view as, a pop-up will appear. Note that when you select save view, the pop-up will display with the current report settings. If you change these, then you will override the current report. It doesn't create a new report. To create a new report, use the Save View As option. Enter the name of the report and check and uncheck boxes for options needed for your report. If you check the My Default box, then each time you select a report, this report will show up. If you uncheck the Run Immediately box, then you have to click a Run button to see the report. We always save our reports with the Run Immediately box check. The Share option allows others to see your report. You can share it with others and be specific to who you share it with. Or you can share with all who have the security to view the report. The default option will make this the main report that opens when that report is selected. That way, if there is a certain adjusted report you want managers or employees to use, to use it will be their default. Don't forget to click or save, save or save and run. The save reports can now be found in My Saved Reports, located in Reports under the Favorites menu. Here is My Saved Reports, where I can see all the reports I have modified. By clicking on the Other <coughs> Settings option, I can see reports shared with me by others. Now that we have modified the columns and saved the reports, Let's create some automated email reports. An automated report can be created for saved report views. This is a sample of an accrued balance as a report. Several clients have found it to be useful, especially when automated. Another example of when to use automated reports could be when you only post payroll to the GL once a month or a listing of employees without a direct deposit amount. The first thing you should do is set your report in the way you want to see it. Then save the view. Click on the action menu icon, the three ellipses on the right, and select manage email schedules. In this window, click, click the add schedule link. If other schedules have already been set up for this report, you would see them here and could edit instead of add. To add a new schedule, just click the add schedule link. Follow the steps to schedule a report. There are two types of schedules. The first type is a weekday schedule. This type can be used for reports that a manager or supervisor needs to see on a regular basis. Like a missed punch report scheduled to run each morning at 9 a.m. for all supervisors. Or it can be a weekly exception report for points tracking. The second type is a day schedule, which can be used for the accrual balance report. This profile lets you send on a specific day, like always on the first of the month, for example. Once the timing is established, then you can decide who will receive the reports. In the early stages, I like to add myself so I can receive a copy of the report. Once the report has been sent successfully, and I am confident the report will continue to send, then I can remove my email. 
Next, I can select a scissor tail account to receive the report, or we can select a specific group like HR admin, or just fill in an email like the company CPA. Or you can just use all the options. Finally, we have a choice to allow the recipients to review the report in their email using my permissions. The report is mailed showing the details from my point of view, just in case the employee needs to see a report. Otherwise, I would have to run the report for them. This takes the report off my plate and the end user gets all the information I usually provide to them without having to and their security settings in Scissor Tail. Now, time to create the email. Choose the, choose the format for the report. My favorite is Excel. Usually, I select display header footer. This is helpful to remind them what the report is for or about. The front email address is always no reply at chronos.com. The message title is your email subject line every time the report is sent. The message body doesn't have to be too detailed. What really matters is the report. Finally, the number <clears throat> of the rows in a report are key. Minimum rows determines if the email should even be sent. Think about a report that goes to payroll for all new direct deposits. If there are none, the report doesn't need to be sent. So the minimum is usually set at one. For the maximum rows, I always use the suggested maximum of 3,500. So now let's take a look at exporting report. Reports can be exported to a variety of file formats, such as CSV, Excel, PDF, XML, and text. But first, let's look at export settings. From within the report screen, click on the action menu, the three ellipses, select export settings. On the advanced setting tab, you can select reports layout. We have a lot of clients that take advantage of the page break option. If you click on the columns to export tab, you can uncheck the columns you don't want to send in the export, but need to be viewed on the report in scissor tail. For example, if you have a report that includes employee social security numbers, you still need to be able to view it on the screen, but for privacy issues, you may need to remove that column from the email exported. You can also add a custom name to the column that will be seen in the exported report. Once you set the export settings, you are ready to export. Click on the action menu, the three ellipses, and select export option. The export window will appear. Select export file and click the down arrow in the file format box. Then select the preferred format and click on export. That's it for customizing, automating and exporting TLM reports. Hey Jim, it's your turn. Tell us about those payroll reports. All right, thank you. Um, I'm getting ready to turn my thing on so everybody might want to guard their eyes for a second. See the glare coming off? Okay. We love your, we love your peach colored <laughs> shirt, Jim. It looks awesome. Hey, I look good today. <laughs> so anyway, we're gonna talk about some things today that deal with the payroll reports and the scissor tail. And so um, one of the things I want to talk about is the basis of your report. So in Scissor Tail, you're never going to 
create a report from scratch. You're always going to choose it from somewhere. So it could be, and as we always say, that every screen that you look at is actually a report. But also, you have the ability to pick the standard reports that they already have. Um, but we'll come back to that here in a second. But I just wanted to make sure that you you uh, get the foundation of what you're trying to accomplish. So here's a few tips for you. Determine what you want for a report. And by the way, I just have to apologize. This is like my first time doing a Zoom deal, so I don't know where I am. <laughs> so determine what you want for a report. So different uh, reports out there have different basis based upon earning deductions or check registers and that kind of thing. So you want to make sure that you know exactly what you want so you can get the exact information that you need uh, when you create or modify the report. So like I said, every screen is a report. You can look at the standard reports. So if you got something out there that you like, uh, then you can put into place some of Mary Lou stuff where you can uh, manipulate the report, take columns off, put columns on, put them where you want. And then also look at your previous saved reports. Maybe you got something you can uh, use and um, that you had previously done. So choose a report that is similar. That's one of my main things. And then make the modifications as needed. And then also when you do that, make sure that you save that new report save view as and Mary Lou had spoke about that because you don't want to override the original uh, and then you would lose that. So see my little uh, cut out on the right hand side over there. You see where saved reports is and everything else are the standard reports and then you have the, the payroll reports down there. So that should help you get a good start and a good basis to uh, start from. Next thing we're going to talk about is filters. And so um, you can go to the next. So there's multiple ways of doing filters, or at least on the reports that you have. And so these are like three different shots here. I just wanted to make sure that you, you saw them. So on some reports, you'll have the pay dates. Uh, I guess I should just say you, sh you should have like the criteria that you can do three different uh, ovals there. I know it's probably not an oval, but but here you can see you have some stuff set up. And then the last thing with the funnel, you can see you have five filters set. And so I'm going to drop down to the third one uh, because this one is we're opening up one of those ovals and this is what we get. So basically it's filters. Uh, so you have global, which can be your pay date stuff and how you want to do your employees. Uh, and then you have column stuff, which is uh, we're going to, you can see that a little bit off to the left hand side, like earning code, but I have a better screenshot next. And then you also have custom, and we'll talk about that. So that's how those criteria go. And then there's some criteria that show up when you go into reports like check register and stuff that you'll get a group uh, that you see in the second um, screenshot. So then that's how you would do your pay dates from there and your employee filter if you have one. And then there's other things on it as well. And so you might find those helpful as well. And even on others, you may see where it says employer. And then you can choose the employer as well. If you have multiple employers, that would be important. So on the next screen, you'll see that I actually have a earning deduction and tax listing. And so what we're doing here is basically showing that just a couple items, uh, last name, uh, record type, and record amount. And I just used different things that you can see off to your right-hand side. I did the little screenshot. There's stuff in there like equal to, not equal to, starts with, doesn't start with, like, not like. You can see you have a multiple things. You just have to know how you want to do your criteria. And then we also have like an in, which is in a, you know, group of things. So, um, so for instance, you can see now that I have one over there, last name starts with uh, S. And then I have a record type, like an earning. Uh, that could have been an equal to earning or it could have been like E-A-R-N. And then on the record amount, you see I have it 
give me everything that's greater than five hundred dollars. So let you know that you have greater than equal to uh, less than that you can use for your column stuff as well. So <clears throat> we'll look at the next one. This is the custom report filters. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I haven't really used this much because just using the other filters seems to help out a lot, but just give you an idea of what it does. So this custom, which is the third tab of the thing that we were looking at before, basically I'm just using some easy stuff here. Company name is equal to ABC, employer last name starts with an R. So it's basically the stuff that we kind of used on the last uh, example. And you can see it gives you a little summary down. Um, you can do ands, ors, you know, that kind of thing. So it gives you that. But like I said, I haven't really gotten in depth with that, that I needed to use it. So, all right. Custom report filters. And I, when we were doing rehearsals this week and stuff, I kept getting confused right here. And it's because both of these were custom. Custom filters is what we just finished. So now we're going to talk about custom <coughs> columns. So custom columns, you can uh, create you know, text fields, numeric fields, money fields, logical fields, and that kind of thing. So uh, you had seen before uh, with Mary Lou going into the three, you know, the ellipsis, the three dots, that we go in there and do an add and remove programs. But down at the bottom left, you can see there's a manage custom columns, and that's where you can create your custom columns at. Um, these are columns that you can create formulas in, logical fields in, and that kind of stuff. When when you're done your custom columns, um, you'll see over on the right-hand side, if we can go back one, once we're done, then you would that we get selected, and you can see the custom column. And they're going to have numbers on them, depending on how many custom columns you have. But uh, so that'll get selected, and then, like Mary Lou said, you can move it wherever you want. And then you can, uh, if you need to go back into it, you just click on custom column there, and it'll take you back into it. So what are we talking about when we say custom columns? Uh, we did this one here. This is for 401k where it takes contributions and puts in loans and stuff. Uh, you can see you can put in a label. And when, once you put that label in, it's actually going to be the, the name of the column. And then this one, we went with numeric. And then we have a format. And format usually deals with, you know, whether there's dollar signs or whatever, and then also decimal places. And then you can see our expression. Uh, I guess I should explain a little bit about the right-hand side. You can see you have some function. You have the functions tab, the constraints tab, and then columns. And you're going to use the functions in the columns. Functions are add, subtract, multiply, uh, you know, those kind of things. Uh, a lot more than that, but um, something that you may want to do when you do your custom. So in our, our deal, we're doing an add. And so then the columns tab is all the columns that you have in scissor tail uh, for those particular reports and stuff. But for instance, in this one here, we're talking about earnings, deductions, taxes, even though we're only looking at deductions. And they'll have, every time you set up an earning, deduction, or tax, it sets up a field for that. And so they'll have different numbers and stuff, as you can see. Uh, so now I can go back to the expression and say, we're doing an add. And when you add in scissor tail, it's not actually putting a plus sign in between two numbers or two fields. It actually puts the word add in front of it. And then we're going to make sure that our amounts are values, and that's why you see value. And then you see that we chose a particular field because we know exactly what that is. Um, you can see more of that when you look at the right-hand side. Uh, even though we picked a field, you can see below it what it means. So, for instance, the second to the last, you can see that that says, even though it's a deduction amount with a number on it, you know it's a 401k employer contribution. That's how you would know that when you're in that column and picking that out. Not so much so in the expression. You just have to make sure you bring it over and you know, select it the right one. So basically that's the expression uh, or, you know, for things that you need to do. You may need to add two columns together. 
Uh, you, um, it may not even be a field that's inside scissor tail. You may be creating your own, right? You're taking one uh, field and adding another field and creating the third field. And, you know, that just, that's what you can do with custom columns. All right, let's see what we got next. All right, so Mary Lou did a lot with reports and sending them out. We're going to talk about delivering reports with payroll. And so what we know is that when we do our payrolls, we have a checklist. And this is probably what you're familiar with on the left-hand side. We have a checklist from add and edit pay statements going all the way down to finalized. And then there's one more after that called deliver payroll. And when you click on that button, it can send reports to emails. Uh, for multiple people or just one, depending on you have, how you have stuff set up. And so basically that's what we're going to talk about here. So uh, moving on. The, so it's kind of like setting up groups for who's going to get what particular email. And one of the most common is basically saying, is somebody in payroll, is somebody in HR, you know, that kind of thing, right? So in this particular one, we're showing in delivery destinations that employee payroll is one that we have. And this is the most common one we use for sending out like checks, direct deposits and stuff to the actual payroll people who are responsible for. So as you can see right now, Brandy and I are in there. Uh, we can put in up to four emails because we're saying that and you can actually do more than that if you change that number. So we can attach this so-called grouping to um, a set of delivery destinations, and that way we can um, I probably just mess that up. Anyway, I just wanted to take notice also that on the delivery destination deal at the bottom, you can actually make your email the way that you want it to be sent out. So um, normally we say some no reply, sending out scissor channel reports, and then in the body of the paper, you have the company name and document names. You can type in what you want in the body of, you know, you know, Mr. Harris, this is the report for whatever. So anyway, that, that's how that works. And then next screen. So here are the delivery policies. And so like pay statements is one of them. And then we will just go in the pay statements and we can select the, uh, email payroll delivery destination, and then that's how the pay statements would get sent out. And I think we have that in the next shot. So we would come into the pay statements and then delivery destination, we would put email payroll. Now, if you remember two slides ago, that email payroll represented uh, Brandy and, and myself in it, and that's who would get sent uh, <coughs> pay statements direct deposits, checks to be printed out. Most of you probably already know that because you do it, but this is how it gets set up and that kind of thing. So, then also we have one last thing to have it deliver the reports after payroll. And that's a, a function. So kind of like Mary Lou's thing where she was scheduling reports to be sent out. It was right below that. And it's a deliver with payroll. So you can enable to deliver with payroll, deliver policy, and like Mary Lou was talking about, what, what's the format you want, uh, copies, so forth and so on, and what's the frequency of it. And so when you were to uh, finalize your payroll and deliver, you could have other reports get printed out for you or sent to you as well. And <clears throat> But I think that's uh, pretty much the end of my session, and I think Rhonda's up next. And she's going to talk about some uh, compliance reporting. Hey, there it is. Yeah, surprise. All right, thanks, Jim. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and jump right into the compliance reports. Um, right here on this screen, we have a list of the standard compliance reports that are already built into Scissortail. Now, each of these compliance forms um, can be populated with employee information, and then all you have to do is fill out any of the remaining details. So um, as a side note, while we're talking about compliance reports, I would like to just mention um, that 
earlier this week or last week, I think it was, we had a meeting of the Tulsa Area Human Resources Board and our VP of Legislative Affairs had mentioned that compliance is going to be a big issue uh, this year and possibly going forward. He said that there have been a huge uptick in DOL and EEO lawsuits in the last several months. And he thinks that or expects this to continue to be an issue in the near future. So um, since so many reports were delayed in 2020 because of the pandemic, um, he said that if you have uh, are expected to report on anything that had been delayed, that you need to know that um, you're going to be required to report for both 2019 and 2020 uh, this year. So just wanted to uh, bring everybody up to date on that. And um, then as we, oops, may need to, okay. Um, sorry, got a little overzealous there. So with that in mind, I wanted to give you a reminder that the EEO reports are coming due on July 19th. Um, this is one of those reports that was delayed in, in uh, 2020 because of the uh, COVID-19 emergency. And so now you're reporting for both 2019 and 2020 this year. And the EEO website is open to begin collecting data at any time, so you don't have to wait until that actual deadline. Uh, but both reports are going to be due on Monday, July 19th. So let's look at how to run the EEO1 report in Scissortail. First, you're going to start under the team icon, uh, then you're going to select HR, go to the form section and choose the government forms. And this is where you're going to see your EEO1 report. Here you're going to click on the component one to create the form. And as time goes by, this is where you'll have a listing of all the EEO1 reports or any of the EEO reports you've created. Uh, from this page. So when this window pops up, you will choose between a single and a multi-establishment employer. And in my demo data, we used the single establishment employer. Then you're going to enter your NAICS uh, number and your unit number if that applies to you and click populate form. The best part of this, as I said before, is that Scissor or Tail is going to autofill most of the form and you'll only have a few items that you're going to be required to complete. Now when you click the populate form, you're going to see the settings screen pop up. And this is where you're going to enter the dates for any pay period between October 1st and December 31st of the reporting year. So this is how you're going to determine which reporting year you are uh, preparing. So uh, you're going to want to do this once for 2019 and again for 2020. Um, my recommendation is that you be consistent with the pay period. If you choose to do the first pay period in November for 2019, try to use the same, the first pay period in November for 2020 as well. Now, this is what Section A of the report will look like. You can see that um, the single establishment, excuse me, single establishment employer report was selected based on how I had uh, set up my um, form as I was beginning to populate it. And then I manually filled in the answer to uh, the second question as in the total number of um, companies that I'm reporting for. So here on the next section, you can see that the company data is already pre-populated based on what is set up in the system. However, the blue areas are areas that you can type in or make changes to if for some reason you forgot to update your company address when you moved over the years, etc. So that can be updated on the fly if needed. 
And then in the next section, this is section C, and this is the section you're going to have to fill out. So you just select the yes or no's on questions one, two, and three. And then once you've done that, you move on and you can view, oh, I keep doing it, Brandy, sorry. Uh, you can view the employee data information. Now this is an example of page two based on my demo data. Um, for a pay period in, I believe it was October of 2020. Um, it's filling in all of my people in the different areas and where, you know, the, all of the demographics and everything that apply. Um, I know this isn't something that we do every day for these once a year type things. I, feel free to reach out and ask questions, use that support uh, email that uh, Sherry mentioned earlier, but this is just one example of how easy it is to complete one of these forms, much easier than uh, we've seen in the past with other products or even trying to do this manually. Um, so it really makes it super easy. I know this was fast, but Brandy, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Awesome. Can you hear me and see me? I can hear you. Hi, I can see you. Hi guys. So fine. Let me click my screen and go on to my phone. So thank you, Rhonda. And so let's get started with turbocharging scissor tail with charts and dashboards. So why do I need to use a chart or a dashboard? It boils down to a chart is an easy way to convey information visually that a user needs. We can customize the dashboards based on the security of the employee. And remember, the goal is for the data to be at the user's fingertips when they need it. So they're, they're not left searching. So let's start off with how and where to create charts. So I pulled up a pay history report where I want to add a chart. So first we'll click the view data icon and it's that little wind looks a little different there next to the filter. Once we click on that, We'll get a pop out and view data is usually the default so that's usually what's selected but you can switch it to view charts then you'd only see charts or you can do view charts and data so let's pick that one and now you can see i've got some charts down at the bottom next we're going to click on create chart then we'll pick the type of chart we want to do and depending on the chart type we'll get different data options available here i picked a line chart and I selected the pay date for the x-axis and the gross pay for the y-axis. I told it to sum the gross pay and I could have told it to do a um, average or a count or something like that, depending on the type of data I have. Then I can select at the bottom of the screen, I can select what items I want to display on the chart. Like if you know, I want to display labels and at the very bottom, I can give the chart a name and say, I want to point out that next to gross pay on the y-axis, there's a plus sign where I can add another category to a chart. This is really handy if you want to do stacked bar charts. So keep it in mind and keep an eye out for that little plus sign. A couple of key notes. You can only save three charts per report. So if you need more than three charts on a particular report, use that save as function like Mary Blue talked to you about earlier. And then you can create three more charts on the new on the new report. So now that we know how to add a chart, how do we use them in our dashboards? So we're going to start off with a home dashboard because there's multiple types of dashboards in scissor tail. So let's start with the home one because it's the one we see most often. It has things like our pay, our timesheets, our accrual balances. It's our typical home for all employees, whether they're an admin uh, or, or department manager or an employee. And we can change this by security group or mass update. It's made up usually of a bunch of widgets, and we're going to talk more about widgets in the future, but widgets give us access to commonly used items that have personal information or managerial information. It'll vary based on security, subsystems enabled, and the configuration of the widgets. So the home page can be viewed at any time by clicking the home link at the bottom of the hamburger menu or when you select your company logo at the top of the DAP and it'll go to the home dashboard if it's set as your first screen in security. 
You'll also notice a laser pointer. I've got a start bar here at the top. It can be nice when you need to put in shortcuts for easy access to commonly used items. And then at the very top in the blue, I have my employee banner. It helps improve the visual experience by adding some color and some additional details. Managers have a variety of responsibilities they need to address on a daily basis. And to help them target their most pressing tasks like timesheets, employee birthdays, etc., today's tasks can be made available on the home screen or on the modular domain dashboards. These quick hit items are hyperlinks that go to the appropriate places in the application. <clears throat> So let's look at how to configure this home dashboard. I have a path to the menu item on the left, and to maximize the screenshot, I, I did screenshots here. So when I pick this, um, the first option is Company Hub. This is a brand new option that just got released in April, where you can show a branded company page with key information about your company. You can add in a news feed, embed videos, put in helpful links to company uh, standards, culture, or announcements. And we're going to be working on rolling that out uh, as soon as we can here. <laughs> then we've got custom dashboards. So domain dashboards, which are a couple down, are things like HR and payroll and accruals. But what if you need a custom dashboard? Maybe you need one for COVID. You can add your own custom dashboards in as well. Show my dashboard. Dashboard allows users to create their own dashboard with their own reports and charts. And in domain dashboards, those are what I talked about, and we'll look at them in more detail in just a minute. Today's task we saw on the previous slide, it's up at the top, it was in the blue, uh, where we could see their birthdays and timesheets to approve and things like that. And then I've got show, start screen on mobile only. It was on the previous screen, uh, the start bar was. but. We usually leave it on for both web and mobile so that there's a consistent experience for the employee. And there's a new widget notification. That can be done, we usually turn this on for admins so that you guys get an alert when a new widget type is added into the system. There are hamburger menu settings below. Most clients are using the new UI, but if you are not, there's still a few that use the classic dashboards. So if you're, your home dashboard didn't look like what I had on the previous slide and you wanna make that change, you can send a support message in, and I'll put a reminder on the last slide uh, to do that. For the bottom of the home dashboard setup screen, you'll see schedules. So administrators can have different dashboards set up for different time frames. So if you want to add something new on a particular date, you can. There's a user can modify. If you want users to be able to modify their dashboards, you can allow them to do that. We usually turn this off. And there's a reset button that will remove any user-made changes and apply the last saved admin version. It's usually not an issue because we don't usually allow users to modify this, the dashboard, so that usually takes care of that problem. But let's look further into the edit button. So here's where I can see how the home dashboard's laid out and make changes. Notice I've got add buttons, just like we had on some of the other things we've been doing. Keep in mind that there are nine slots on the dashboard that can, can contain various types of content. If you select add, you'll see where you can add reports or charts to the, to the dashboard, and you can add widgets. And there's a whole bunch of them. There's also, uh, you can always also create your own custom content, just like we saw on the company hub where you can put links to maps and other websites. So here's a list of all those widgets that are currently available. There are new ones added with each release, and I put new next to the ones that just came out in April. So keep an eye out for new ones as you see them pop up. Ones in red are typically used for employees, and the ones in blue are typically for managers and admins. But I would recommend taking a look at all of them and see which ones might be helpful for your team. Next, let's talk about domain dashboards. So these can be customized to show reports and graphs to employees, managers, and admins to make things easier to access. And keep in mind, this is just like everywhere else at Scissor Tail. Clicking the blue words at the top of each graph, which are the name of the report, takes you to that report. So you can dive deeper into the information easily. Those domain dashboards are, high, are outlined up at the top right now. So that's where you see the payroll benefits, HR, et cetera. So let's dive deeper. 
Similar to what we saw on the home dashboard, any charts or reports can be added to domain dashboards. We use the gear to, to change what domain tabs we see and add new custom tabs. I'm looking at the team domain dashboard and you'll see most of these are reports. I see things that are handy for managers like missing punches, timesheet changes, uh, attendance boards, etc. Here's an example of a payroll domain dashboard. And you'll see it looks very different. It has many more charts than we saw on the team dashboard. Once I click in the edit mode, you'll have the same add button we saw on the home dashboards. And the only difference is we can't add custom dashboards front to the domain dashboards, custom widgets to the domain dashboards. Once I exit the edit mode, my changes are saved. And then I can share my dashboards with everyone or make it their defaults, just like you can with reports. All the tiles can be reordered or resized using the three dots or ellipse button. There are tons more we could talk about with charts and dashboards, but that should be enough to get you started on the path to being a report and dashboard champion with Scissortail. So to wrap up today, we dove into reporting in Scissortail. We covered everything from a basic report to adding custom filters and columns, compliance reporting, and building dashboards. As we go, as we went into dashboards, if your home screen doesn't have the widgets and you want to get it changed to show them, we can help you do that. If your domain dashboards are blank, because we've filled those in on newer clients, but some of the older clients might not have them. If you need help, we can copy in some of our default charts to get you started. Just send an email to support. You'll see down at the bottom of the screen if you need help with either. And keep in mind, we're here and we work in Scissortail all day, every day. So when you run into a new issue or unusual task, we're here to help with a quick email to support. Sherry, that's it from the HCM team. Back to you. Okay, excellent. That was really, really good. Um, can you guys see my screen now? Yep, yes. I can see. Okay. Um, well, that was really super full of information. We're running close on time and we want to make sure that we, you know, uh, uh, really uh, are respectful of everybody's calendars. So we've got time for maybe one or two questions. Um, if you have a question that doesn't get answered, then just fill it out in the survey and the team will, they look through all of those, the, your information in the post webinar survey and we can get those questions answered for you um, in the next day or two. So the, the one question I have, it says, what do recipient permissions mean versus my permissions? What does that do uh, whenever you're emailing a report? You guys want me to take that one? Sure. So um, when you're emailing the report, you have those two options of uh, use my permissions, which is kind of what Mary Lou described where if you do a, if there's a report you need to email out and you want to show everybody in a department and it goes to an admin and they don't have rights to see everybody, you could use my permissions and, and filter it down to that exactly what needs to be sent out. If you use the recipient's permissions, then they only see who they have rights to see and what they have rights to see. So if it's a department manager and you say send this to all department managers, it'll filter and only show the employees that report to that department manager by using the recipient permissions. So that's, per that's perfect. That was one that uh, another one that had come in. Then uh, this other question is, can you email reports to non scissor child users? And can you prevent that from happening? Well, that's a good question. You definitely can send them to non scissor tail users. Um, Preventing that from happening, that's a little more tricky. I don't know a good answer on that one, Rhonda, do you? Um, yeah, we can actually set those reports to have a password on them uh, as part of that process. So if they're password protected, even if they were emailed to someone, if they don't have the password, they wouldn't be able to open it. Ah, there you go. I think that will take care of it. And then the last question, and then we'll wrap up, is can you... When you're in the report view, I'm sure it's what they're meaning here, can you drag and drop a column in the view? I think like Excel, where you can just slide it over for temporarily? No. Okay. 
So any column changes, you would go into the manage column function. Yeah, the add or remove columns. Now you can do some clicks on them to do sorting and, and the filters and stuff, but you can't add or remove columns or reorder them there. Perfect. Okay, well, let's finish up. Thank you.